So would you believe that this double integral, and not because I said so, would you believe that this guy is equal to the double integral over R of the curl of F, whoops, curl, dot K dA. All right, before we go on, I have to help you believe that. And, and we can use this result to get an interpretation of curl. That's why we're going here. And also, it sets us up for Stokes theorem next week. Um, so do you believe that at all? Hmm, we better say some words about that, right? What's the curl? Let's, that's a good place to start. Let's, let's start there. Um, so F is a vector field, and uh, it has components P, Q, and R. If F is restricted to the plane, then Z equals zero, and we don't consider P and Q functions of X, Y, and Z, right? But if we allow it to be in space, then, then we, we do uh, consider P and Q and what I'm going to call R, different R than what I just wrote down, um, as functions of X, Y, and Z. So in fact, since I'm going to write that down, let's change it just for now. Let's change the region of integration to D because that is disturbing when you have two different things named the same way. Whoops. Habit. It's a hard habit to break. Okay. So R is going to be, for right now, the component of the vector field. So what is then the curl of F? Well, this is a good review. If we want at least part of the generic formula, what do we do with del, the vector operator, the vector of operators? We cross it with F, right? So del cross F, not a true cross product, but it looks like one. OK, so let's set it up. I, J, K. Del is what? D, DX, D, DY, D, DZ. And then F has components P, Q, and R. Now, kind of like in that one example we did, because I'm going to dot this with K, which is, has components 0, 0, 1, I'm not going to do the full demonstration of the formula. I'm just going to get the third component of it. And so if we get the third component, you know, it's going to be, you know, something times I, uh, put a box there, something times I minus something times J. I'm interested in the, the something times, times K. So what do you do to get that? You cross out the last column and look at what you get. Everybody see what you get? Something pretty familiar? You get dq dx, derivative of q with respect to x, <coughs> minus derivative of p with respect to y. Well, and then times k, right? And, and keep in mind, you get, you get derivatives in here as well, which, which you don't memorize because you can compute using this pseudo cross product, right? You get, in other words, you get formulas in the box involving these partial, uh, similar partial derivatives as well, but I'm not going to fill those in right now. So that when I, that's, that's the part of the curl I care about. So when I take the dot product of the curl of F and K, since the only component that's non-zero there, is one, I end up just multiplying these guys together and adding you know, something times zero, which is zero plus something times zero. So I take that dot product, and of course, I do get my, my integrand. And, and remember, that's what, we were, that's what we were shooting for, right? That's the integrand of Green's theorem. We'll finish the class with maybe uh, a quick interpretation of curl, and we'll get more in depth next week. Okay, so we have this relationship. The line integral with respect to the vector field is equal to, okay, Green's theorem says it's the integral over D 
of the curl of F dotted with K dA. Now, what if C encloses a super small region? So let's say, uh, now remember, this is only going to work for a closed C, counterclockwise orientation. And this guy in here is D or R, or whatever you want to call it. Really, we could go back to calling it R since we're, we're looking in the plane, but I won't do that. No. What did I do? Let's fix that. I did that just to see if you're awake. <laughs> do you believe that? Almost didn't work. <laughs> so uh, let's say this, is, this region is super small. Like imagine, it, imagine, it, imagine its area going to zero. Imagine C shrinking around a point inside that region, in fact. So let's call this point, this is point P, so there's no arrow over it. So P stands for point here. Then, as long as, as long as that region D is super small, F won't change much. The values of the vector field won't vary much over that region. Would you buy that statement? Okay. So then we could say this. We could say that this line integral will be approximately equal to the curl integral of the curl evaluated of F evaluated at P so that it's constant. And of course, K is constant. So that, that that dot product is constant. Well, then that entire integram becomes constant. And what can we do with it? We can pull it out. And so then if we pull it out, we get the curl of F evaluated at P dot K out in front times a double integral. I wanted to write R again. Old habits are hard to break, DA. R, hard to break, yes, very good. <laughs> <laughs> Joke of the day. Um, now, when the integrand is one, what does that integral represent? The area of? D, it's D, we decided. <laughs> so it's curl of F evaluated at P dotted with K times the area of the region. So I'll put that in parentheses. And then what do we have on the left? Uh, we have, I'll leave it an equal to, but realize it's approximate, and it's only equal in the limit as C shrinks around P, right? Assuming that, 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 it, that it works, that that limit works. Oh, well then we can just divide both sides by area and get an interpretation of curl of F at P dot with K, can't we? Yeah? So that's what we're going to close out the class with. And we'll talk about it a little bit. And like I said, more next time. So, okay, if I turn this around so that I have the curl on the left side, curl F at P, don't forget the dotted with K, would equal the integral over C, F dot dr over area. Now, you guys already have the, the tools to come up with one interpretation, but it's not really going to be the one we're looking for because I'm not sure how we can apply that very well. Um, we know that integral represents work if F is a force field, right? So I suppose the curl of F at P dotted with K can represent some sort of work done per unit area. But that's not a work density. Sure, why not? But that's not what we're after. That's not what we're after. We need to quickly interpret for C a closed curve. What, a, what, what could that line integral represent for C a closed curve? Well, let's go back to the picture. So what, so what is this? Well, C is a closed curve. Well, that's true. <laughs> I drew a, a closed curve around the integral. Smart Alec. Okay. Um, everybody's a comedian. All right. So. Remember our first interpretation of the line integral over the vector field? We didn't write it this way, did we? We wrote it as the integral over C F dot T, unit tangent vector, in, or tangent vector in the direction of motion, D little s, right? Okay. So, and then we got, if F was a force field, we used that to get an interpretation of work. 
But okay, looking at C, let's suppose at this point there's a value of T, right? And we assume that that this region, including C and its interior, is immersed in some sort of vector field, right? And I'm not going to be specific here. It could be a velocity field. It could be a force field. It doesn't really matter for this interpretation. So we've got all kinds of vectors from F around, right? All kinds of vectors from F. In, in particular, I'm sure you could find one right here, couldn't you? Okay. When is, so the integral, the dot product of that integral has to do with the angle between these guys, right? Yeah. We know that. When is, when then is this in relation to that angle between them, when is that dot product, that integrand, going to be the largest? When f and t are pointing in the same direction. Would you buy that? Yeah. So the bigger f dot t is, the more the vector field is pushing around that curve, right? The more the vector field is circulating around that curve. Would you buy that? Well, that's going to be our interpretation of the line integral. So f dot t ds would be a, a circulation element. It would just be like the circulation happening in near this point. But what does the integral do? It adds up all circulation elements. So this, this just the f dot t ds would be a circulation element. And then the integral itself would be interpreted as the total circulation of f around c. And we're not going to get into units here, but we'll just say this. The bigger then that line integral is, the more the vector field is circulating around c. And keep in mind, this interpretation only works if we have a closed curve, right? OK, so now let's go back to this relationship down here. If we call this guy circulation, then we get an idea of where the name curl comes from. So the curl of F evaluated at P dotted with K, which, which by the way, since, since K is a unit vector, that's just really, if you take the, the, the absolute value of, the, of that dot product on the left, that's just the amount of curl, or, or remember curl of F, dot, uh, F at P is a vector, right? It's the, it's the magnitude of that in the direction of K, right? It, it's, it's a, it's a pro it really is a projection. It would be if, you, if you analyze the projection formula we developed way back in chapter 12, when this guy's a unit vector, then that, that is the, at least the, it's not the projection formula, because remember the projection of, of u onto v, a vector onto another vector, is a, is a vector, right? But it would be, uh, its absolute value would equal the magnitude of that vector. So you can think of this as the amount of curl in the direction of, of the unit vector, okay? So here's our interpretation to close out the class. And like I said, we'll talk more about it next week. The curl of F at P dotted with K gives you the circulation around um, C, but it's per unit area. So then curl is going to kind of measure point-wise at, at like a point P, how much the vector field is twisting around that point P. Okay, so that's kind of a point-wise interpretation of curl.